Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everything that you've done in my life, the way that you saved me from the hell that I was living in, from my addiction, and now um, being able to be in Brazil. I just want to thank you for your faithfulness along the way. And I just want to pray for every, every person out there that's listening. I just pray that you give them hope today as I share these things that are on my heart, this message that you have given me. Um, and I just pray for hope today, that hope will be in the hearts of the people listening, and that you can give us, you can encourage us, you can send us out on our way to change the world around us and to make your name known. And so God, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the listeners out there. And I just pray that it is a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, I've been in Brazil for two months now, um, I think two months and maybe a couple weeks. And it's been amazing. And like I said, I've been able to preach in about 15 or 16 different churches in Brazil so far as an American missionary. And of course, I have to have a translator and so that's always a fun experience, translating, preaching with the translator. And so one of the messages I was able to share recently was called spiritual hunger. And it was really exciting to me because in Brazil, it's something that I had to come again. I had to really seek after again because for so long, I was in Teen Challenge, in the Adult and Teen Challenge program as a student and then as a staff. And it was so easy to be surrounded by God. It was so easy to, to see the presence and to feel him. Because I was in worship every single day, I was in a church service every single day, and that was just normal life to me. And then going to Youth with a Mission in Hawaii and Asia, um, it was a little more broadened. Like I spent time in presence, and I spent time in worship with YWAM and group things like that. But here in Brazil, I really have to seek it on my own. I go to church services to preach, and I, I'm a part of some other church things throughout the week and the weekend but it's all in Portuguese. The worship is in Portuguese. The speaking is in Portuguese. And so for me, I really have to find it in myself. I have to have that spiritual hunger to seek after God on my own time. And someone recently asked me in a podcast was, Dallas, how often, how often do you have to seek God to see the results that you have? And the answer is easy. I have to seek God. Like There's times in my life when I seek God because I want to, and then there's times in my life when I seek God because I have to. And right now, it's a have to moment. This is not about just oh, Christianity is beautiful. I'm doing this thing called Christianity. Like, no, this is real. This is life or death. Like, I am in the mission field right now. I live in the mission field. And I feel the, the tension. I feel the opposition every single day being here with the language barrier, with just all different types of customs and culture that I'm not used to. And it's been a challenge for sure, but God has been faithful along the way. And so um, the spiritual hunger. And so something that I was kind of praying through and something that God was speaking to me was about spiritual hunger. And so I came up with these four keys, four keys to spiritual hunger that can transform the world around you. About coming to Brazil, um, I'm not 100% sure why I'm here yet, honestly. I don't know why I'm in Brazil yet. God told me to come here and I came on a word of faith. To be honest, I wasn't 100% sure that it was God's voice in the first place, but I was really confident. I was like, I think this is God. I'm, I'm really going to go for it. And I'm here and it's been amazing. Like, I can't even believe that I even questioned it. It's so obvious that I'm supposed to be here. And so something that, yeah, God was really showing me is that when he, when he doesn't show you the next step in your life of what, of, for what you to do, do the last thing that he told you. And for me, that last thing that he told me to do was to just preach the gospel. And so simply, that's what I'm doing. I have opportunities to preach, and I go and preach the gospel, different words that he's placed on my heart. What I, my purpose in Brazil right now, if I could say that my focus and what I'm directed towards right now is just to bring a spiritual hunger to the church of Brazil. I don't care about the denominations, about the denominational boundaries, whatever church it's a part of. If I'm invited, I want to go. An opportunity is an opportunity in my mind. And I just think that we should give glory the God he deserves, give God the glory that he deserves with as a united church. It, like we are the church. It's not the building, it's the people. And so that's kind of my purpose in Brazil right now. My focus is to just bring a fresh hunger to the people in the churches of Brazil. Um, eventually, I'll have a translator that I can go out on, on the streets and do street ministry like I did in Asia and I did in Hawaii. But for now, I'm only in the churches. And so I'm really excited to, in the future, be a part of street ministry and other types of ministries here in Brazil. Um, it kill, I'm going to be honest. It kills me to see churches full of bodies, full of people, that have the potential to change the world, but no one is actually stepping out. No one is actually making the difference, making the change to see the results that we need. Um, there are tons of giftings in Brazil, in Brazil. There's tons of giftings in the church that people need around, the people that you might work with, the people that you see every single day, but we're being held back. Um, there's a movement happening in Brazil. I've seen it the last couple months, and I've heard of other 
programs and the dunamis movement and other things that are happening in Brazil and the sin is happening in Brazil in February and there's a huge movement happening but we need this a new hunger and a new boldness to step out past the resistance and to join in with what the Holy Spirit is doing and people are actually going to hell every single day because we're afraid to step out we're afraid to be to be judged for our faith we're afraid to look crazy for our faith but I want to just give a message right now that what God has been speaking to me that a true spiritual hunger can really transform our world that we live in. For a long time, for me, God was just a person I ran to when things went bad. God was a place I went on Sundays to clean myself from the crap I did during the week. But what I've learned is God is not a plan B. He is all that I have. Here in Brazil, He is all that I have. Christianity is not a weekend function. It is a lifestyle. I think sometimes we romanticize this hunger for Jesus, this hunger for God, saying, um, it sounds beautiful. We say things like, I am passionate for Jesus. But I want to challenge you on what real passion looks like. I think true passion, true hunger for Jesus is disruptive. It's very painful. Jesus begins to infect us with a virus that over days, months, years, and decades, it causes us to cut off things in our life to hinder us from encountering his presence. And there's nothing beautiful about that. There's nothing beautiful about a real desperate faith. And so I want to share a few examples from the Bible today of people who had a real desperate hunger that changed the situation that they were in. And they were caring nothing at all of what the world thought of them or what the people around them thought. They were desperate for their miracle, searching for their miracle. They weren't going to leave that situation or settle for anything other than their miracle. And so that's the kind of faith that I want to look at today is just that desperate hunger of like, no, I'm not leaving this place right here. I'm not leaving this prayer room. I'm not leaving my knees until I see results. And so that's kind of the, the direction of this message today. I just want to ask the listeners right now, how many of you right now need a miracle in your life? And I'm not saying you just need a better paycheck or you need a new car or a better house, or I'm saying a real miracle. Maybe your marriage is in trouble. Maybe you, your finances are in trouble and you can't meet the next house payment. Maybe it's one of your children are lost in the world right now. You know, whatever that miracle is, maybe you're sick with cancer that can't be healed by any man. You know, whatever your miracle might be, Jesus is greater. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, I want to look at two things as we look at the text from the Bible that we're going to look at. The desperate faith of these people and the response of Jesus. How many times have you been seeking God for something and he didn't actually answer you the way you expected? His response might not look the way you expected, but I promise you it's always the perfect one. God answers prayers from a desperate heart. Desperate times call for desperate measures. My testimony, three years ago I was a drug addict and I was on my face at a place called Rock Bottom strung out on a drug addiction. And he met me in my hunger. He met me in my desperation. I knew there was more. I knew that there was only one that could save me and I knew it was him. He picked me up when I was still dirty. And I'm here today in Brazil as a missionary because God answers desperate prayers. I have four keys to a spiritual hunger that can transform the world around you. The first one is hunger is a gift. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. Hunger is a gift. We can have as much God in our life as we want. We can have as much Jesus in our life as we allow. It's a choice. We can choose to keep just coming to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, or we can choose to be the church everywhere we go. The text I want to look at right now is Luke chapter 8, verse 40 through 56. And I'm not going to read the entire text um, just for time's sake, but the summarization of this is there's a woman with the discharge of blood for 12 years, and this blood hasn't stopped. I'll start reading at 42. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had, who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all of her livelihood on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who is it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. That is important to me. That She thought this woman has been having this problem, this discharge of blood for 12 years, and she spent her entire livelihood trying to be healed by doctors, and no one could help her. She tried everything to deal with this problem. But she heard that this Jesus was in town, and she said, maybe if I could just touch Jesus, maybe if I could just touch his garment, maybe I'll be healed, just maybe. And Jesus walks past her. He doesn't walk up to her because her, he knows that she has a problem. He walks past her. 
And she thought, maybe if I could just touch him. The second she touches his garment, the discharge of blood stopped immediately. It hasn't stopped in 12 years. And Jesus responds, who touched me? And what's crazy to me is that Jesus is surrounded by thousands of people right now. And Peter says, Jesus says, who touched me? And Peter replies, Master, you're surrounded by the masses. Everyone's touching you. But Jesus says this. This is the response that I want to look at from Jesus. No, I perceive that power has gone out for me. Someone broke past the status quo. Someone pushed past the resistance. I feel a desperate hunger in this woman. Someone touched me. And that, that just blows my mind. Is like Jesus was surrounded by people, being touched by a ton of people. But one woman who had a desperate hunger changed the situation. Jesus felt that. He was drawn by her. I think so many times in the church today, we can be guilty of just being around Jesus, but never actually touching him. And I believe that the time of, Christian, of, the time of minimum Christianity is over. Jesus didn't just die for me to show up to church on Sunday and Wednesday. And he didn't die for me just to, for my 10% offering. He didn't die so that I can just live my life on the sidelines and do nothing. God isn't looking for visitation. He's looking for habination. He died that we may carry his name to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what happened here. This woman touched Jesus. The people that that you are surrounded by in your life, that realm of influence that you have, the people at your job, the people at your work, uh, you know, wherever you may be in your day, they need you to touch Jesus. They need you to touch Jesus. Point number two, hunger must be acted on or it will fade. Hunger must be acted on or it will fade. I want to look at Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus. And they came to Jericho, and there he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd. Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, and was sitting by the roadside. And when, Jesus, and when they, he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out even all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? Okay, that text is amazing also. Um, it says, Bartimaeus was blind from birth. And he tried, he tried everything he could. Like, from birth, no one could help him from this disease. No one could help him from this blindness that he had. From birth. And so he lived with this. It doesn't say how old he was, but he lived for many, many, many years as a blind man. And he couldn't see, but he could speak. And so he begins to cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me. He's not going to miss his opportunity. If if this man, Jesus, is who they say that he is, healing the blind, healing the sick, casting out demons, if this is the guy that they say he is, I believe that he could heal me too. And so he, he cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the people in the crowd begin to say, Be quiet, shut up. You know Who are you to cry out to Jesus? Who are you to cry out to the Son of David? And he cries out all the more. He pushes past the resistance and he says, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David. And Jesus stops. Arguably, one of the best verses in, in the scripture is Jesus stopped. Could you imagine having the type of hunger that stopped Jesus himself in his tracks? And what I love about this is that Jesus goes up to him. And he doesn't say, Bartimaeus, what is your problem? How can I help you? He doesn't say, um, what is your name? You know, who's your father? What type of religion? Did you go to church this week? You know, he didn't ask any of those questions. Jesus is not a respecter of persons. He said, what can I do for you? What do you want me to do for you? He doesn't care about the situation. Psalm 42, 7 says, deep cries out to deep. And Jesus is, Jesus is saying here, I don't need to know your name. I don't need to know your issue. But whatever caused that deep cry that came out of your spirit called out to a deep in my spirit. Jesus is like, what what can I do for you? Anything you want is yours because I know that deep cry came at a cost. And Jesus becomes a blind man's servant. He answers Jesus, Lord, let me see. And he was healed. What if the churches, what if for me, because I preach this church in Brazil, and so this is what the the message was directed towards. But let's just say the church in general. What if the church got so desperate, got that desperate for a spirit of revelation? What if the church began to get a cry, God, break off the blindness of the church and awaken a real spiritual hunger in our lives? Imagine what the church would look like. Imagine what our cities would look like, the the amount of influence that the Christians have. I mean, just imagine what it could look like. Point number three is hunger produces hunger. Hunger produces hunger. And I want to look at Mark chapter 2. Jesus heals a paralytic. And this is the story of the persistent friends. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, and it was reported that, that he was at home, and many and so many were gathered together, 
and so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. And they, when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Those four friends, they were so hungry that they were willing to carry their paralytic friend to a city where Jesus was preaching. And it doesn't say how far that they had to travel, but if you've ever carried a man on a cot, if you've ever carried a man on a stretcher, you know that it is not an easy task. And so these four men, it's probably hot that day. I'm not sure if they had shoes on or whatever, but my mind, I just like to paint the picture. And so I imagine these four guys carrying their friend to the city where Jesus is preaching. And they get there, and they're not going to know, in my mind, they don't know how many people are going to be at this house where Jesus is at. They just hear that he's in town. And so they show up, and the bad news is, oh no, the place is surrounded. We just, there's so many people here, we can't even see Jesus. And they just carried their friend all the way here, and they could have stopped. They could have stopped because of the resistance. They could have stopped because of the opposition. It didn't look possible. How are they going to get their friend to Jesus to be healed? If he is the man that they say he is, surely he could heal him. This is what blows my mind. They had the great idea to lower him through the roof. Are you kidding me? That means they had to carry him onto the roof. Not only did they carry a man on a stretcher to the city, they carried a man on a stretcher onto a roof. The question that I have is where did they get the ladder? You know, how did they even get on the roof? What faith they must have had to think to even put a man on a roof? That the, and, and that is a true faith, in my opinion. Faith, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. They labored to get a paralyzed man on the roof with the faith to believe that he wouldn't, they wouldn't have to carry him home. That is faith. That is true hunger. They thought if we could just get him on the roof, if we could just lower him down to the crowd, to Jesus, maybe, just maybe he can walk home. And what I love about this is when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus saw their faith, he saw the faith of his friends. This man was healed by the faith and the hunger of his own friends. Hunger produces hunger. These guys could have been at the, in the crowd with Jesus getting fed by his words, but instead they were digging a hole in a roof on a hot day for their friend. This man was healed by their hunger. Your hunger is contagious. If you go to work every day, if you go to your those places where you go, wherever you go throughout your day, throughout your life, your hunger will encourage other people. You know, you, your light, your, if you're a light per se, you're going to light other people on fire. My fourth point, hunger pushes past the silence. Hunger pushes past the silence. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. And I'm not going to read the text yet because I want to tell you about it first and then we can read the text. But this is a Canaanite woman with, a, with her daughter who is severely demon-possessed. And this is actually my favorite part of this entire sermon, is this point right here. So this Canaanite woman comes up to Jesus and the disciples with her daughter who is possessed, and she is looking for healing. She's looking for a miracle. And Jesus may offend some of you right now. Jesus remained quiet. Jesus didn't answer. The scripture says, And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. That blows my mind. That is so crazy to me. The Jesus that I know, if you cry out to him, he's going to answer you, right? So that's a completely different version of who Jesus is. And I really had to spend some time on this. God, why did you not answer her? Why did you not answer this desperate woman? Clearly, she needs you. Clearly, she's desperate. But God sees things differently than we do. Sometimes God stays quiet for us to see how we react. Jesus was intentional when teaching his disciples. Let's continue to read in the, read in the text. And but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answers, and I'll, I'll break that down for you. The disciples say, Jesus, send her away. She's annoying us. That's today's terms. And Jesus, she's annoying us. Please send her away. Verse 24, he answered, And I, I was sent out only to the lost sheep of Israel. This is what Jesus is speaking. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's tables. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for it to you as you desire. And her, and her daughter was instantly healed. I had to really spend a lot of time in prayer on, this, on these verses 21 through 28. Like, God, first off, you didn't answer this woman. Second off, she, then she turned to the disciples. And the disciples said, She's annoying us. Like, this is ministry. They're supposed to be doing ministry. They're supposed to be healing people, making, uh, showing people the kingdom of heaven. 
But instead, the disciples are saying, Jesus, she's annoying us. Like, in my opinion, that's not, that's not real ministry, right? And then we continue to read on, and Jesus responds, I was only sent for the lost sheep of Israel. I don't, I don't fully understand this because I'm not a theologian, but from the revelation that I understand is God had other plans for Jesus at that time. Jesus only ever did what his father was directing him to do. And many times Jesus says, I am about my father's business. And she, she kneels down to him. She gets on her knees before Jesus and she says, Lord, help me. Like her daughter is demon possessed. She's crying out in desperation. And, and he answers. This is what Jesus responds to her. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Um, I prayed about this and my, my understanding from this, it can totally be different. But this is the revelation that I got that has really encouraged me. From what I understand of this is that Jesus is saying that like, you're not ready to receive yet. You're not ready to receive uh, the things that I'm speaking, the revelations that I have. Jesus spoke in parables for a reason, and for those that who had ears would listen. And this woman was not ready to receive the revelations of God and the parables of Jesus. She was still young in her faith, she, but she was desperate. That's the thing. She was young in her faith. She wasn't ready to receive. She couldn't understand the revelation. She couldn't understand the parables, but she was desperate. She turned that not-so-encouraging word from Jesus. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she turns it into intercession by saying, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And so what I understand from that is this woman is saying, yes, maybe I don't understand fully what you're speaking about, Jesus. Maybe I don't understand your parables in depth, the way that you speak, but I'm desperate and I will not leave this place right now until I see some results. That's the way that I understand that. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She's saying, I will do whatever it takes to have something from you. I'm not leaving until you show me something, Jesus. That's the kind of hunger that we need. That's the kind of hunger that pushes past the silence. Receiving anything from Jesus was better than the hell that she was living in in that moment. She cried, give me something, give me something. She didn't care what it took. She was searching for her miracle. Nothing else would do. She was undignified for Jesus. Sometimes we need to just push past the silence and pursue Christ even when it is, un when it is uncomfortable for us. Even if it makes us look desperate, we need to sit with our face on the ground with a desperate heart, willing to uncompromise until we see the results that we're seeking after. There's a verse in the scripture, Matthew 7, 7, that says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. If you're going to knock, like there's one thing to ask for something. It's another thing to seek after something, right? If you're seek, if you lost your car keys and you're seeking after them, like you're, you're really looking all over for them, but you're knocking, If you're really knocking for something, like you're going to stay there until someone answers the door, right? You're knocking, knocking, knocking. And that's what I see right now. That's what I see. This, we need to knock, seek, and ask for those things that we need from God. Like it's, not just, it's not good enough to just be like, God, save me from this. You know, help me. Like we need to seek Him. There's something powerful about seeking Him. There's something powerful about knocking on that door. And it will be open to you. He is a gentleman. He will open that door, I promise you. And through this woman's unwavering persistence, Jesus said, O oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done as you desire. And her daughter was healed. Through her faith to pursue Jesus, he met her right where she was. He met her in her hunger, and he gave her her miracle. So in this podcast today, I've talked about blindness, demon possession, sickness, um, whatever the epidemic may be in your life. It may be these things too. It may be restoration in your marriage, in your relationships, your child to know Jesus, like I said in the beginning. Jesus is greater than whatever resistance you have. Jesus is greater than whatever opposition there is right in front of you. Keep pressing through the resistance. Keep pressing past the silence. If Jesus doesn't answer you the way that you think, his response is always the best one. His response is always greater than the way that we think it should be. And something that we need to remember is that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days, right? He was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. So many times we're in that wilderness and we're like, God, why am I here? Why am I here? Jesus was led into the wilderness. He was led into those times of desperation. And Jesus left the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what blows my mind. He went in the, he was led by the Holy Spirit into a wilderness, into the desert, and he left in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm telling you guys, if you put these battles in the hands of God, this opposition, these things that you're so desperate for, your miracle, if you put it in the hands of God, God will use that. God will use that thing that you put inside of his hands. 
Jesus is alive, and he wants to meet you right where you are today. He wants to bring healing into your life, into your situation. Are you content with just sitting and waiting for a miracle, or are you going to seek and, seek and search after him for your miracle? This is not a prosperity gospel. I just want to make that clear today. Is I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel today. Um, I'm not saying that once you give your life to Christ, and if you've, if you've never done that, we're going to have an opportunity today. But what I'm saying is, this is not a prosperity gospel. This is not saying that once you give your life to Jesus, everything will be easier and you'll receive 100% healing from your problems. You'll be rich after this, after you say amen. Like, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you really surrender your life to him, he will use the very trials to transform your life from the inside out. Let my life be a testimony to you. Three years ago, I was a drug addict. I had nothing to offer. And today, I've been in four different nations this year preaching the gospel. God is faithful. All I did was say, yes, Lord. All I did was say, yes. I didn't do anything else. But he's faithful. And times have been tough. Times will be hard in your future. But like I said, if we have this spiritual hunger, if we follow these four keys, hunger is a gift. Hunger must be acted on or it will fade. Hunger produces hunger, and hunger pushes past the silence. If we use those things to live our life, we could transform the world around us. In closing, what kind of love is that that a father would send his only son to be murdered for crimes that he didn't even commit? That we may have an opportunity to be called sons and daughters of God. Jesus truly showed us mercy. Mercy that leads us to repentance, and repentance leads us to salvation. And that salvation can lead to a hunger to infect other people to do the same thing over and over. And so I just want to call out to the people right now who are listening, who may have never given their life to Christ. I want to give you an opportunity right now. Just close your eyes right now. Maybe if you're driving, don't close your eyes, please. But just in your heart, just give yourself to God. Just say yes to Him. Just give Him, ask Him to be, your, to be the Lord of your life. He will not let you down, I promise you. And I just want to lead us out in prayer today. Thank you so much for this opportunity to, to share this message. And as you can tell, I'm very excited about it. I love preaching this message here in Brazil. And I really hope that it goes on to help other people outside of Brazil that aren't in these, inside of these churches. And so, Heavenly Father, I'm so humbled today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be in Brazil, to serve your name, to make your name known throughout the nations, um, and especially in Brazil, where my heart is so dear. And I just pray for these people that are listening today, for those people who may want to give their life to Christ. I just pray that this sermon would be an encouragement to them today, that my testimony would be an encouragement to them today, that there is hope, God, that there is hope, that you have a plan for us. And God, I just pray for every single person listening right now, that they will have a new spiritual hunger, God, that we, as we enter into your presence and we leave, we will never enter, the, we will never leave the same. God, that we will never leave your presence the same way that we entered in. And so I just pray that you infect us with a deeper hunger. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I just pray for a new hunger to seek after you and to have a fire in our hearts to infect the people around us in our life. And all of these things, I just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for this podcast. God bless.